Welcome to Minnesota Legislative Report, our region's longest running public affairs program. Lawmakers from Northeastern Minnesota are joining us today for a recap of the week's activities at the state capitol. This is your opportunity to call or email your legislative questions and have them answered live on the air. Minnesota Legislative Report starts now. Hello and welcome to Minnesota Legislative Report. I'm your host, Tony Sertich. It was another hectic week at the state capitol in St. Paul with more budget bills being heard and moved through the legislative process. With three, le three weeks left to go to the end of the legislative session, lawmakers will continue at a brisk pace. We encourage viewers to call with your questions for the lawmakers who represent you. The phone number is on your screen or you can send your questions in an email to ask at pbsnorth.com. Org. Joining us in studio is Representative Natalie Zeleznikar, a Republican from Friedenburg Township, representing Minnesota House District 3B. Welcome, Representative Zeleznikar. Thank you. And Representative Liz Olson is a DFLer from Duluth, representing House District 8A. Welcome, Representative Olson. Great to have you both here. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Representative Zeleznikar, you were with us already this year. Representative Olson, it's your first time, and you are, since we saw you last session, the chair of the Ways and Means Committee. Now, our viewers might be uh, interested in what that means. Normally, committees are named agriculture and economic development, but Ways and Means, what does that committee do, and what is your job as chair of that committee? That is a great question, because the title isn't doesn't explain a lot, but what it does is we have broad oversight of the whole state budget. So anything that spends money or has a fiscal impact will come through the Ways and Means Committee. So we had we help set what each committee, so whether it's agriculture or health and human services or whatever budget area, we help set the amount of money that that area can spend. And so we see the whole global budget and then we hold each area essentially accountable to spending within what we call a target. And then all of those bills come through our committee so that we can them for the financial pieces of those bills so even though they for policy and everything else have gone through their relevant committees were the last stop before they go to the house floor so we see the entirety of the budget in the ways and means committee great and so now we're going to focus on a lot of those spending bills but also the tax bill today as well we have two members of the house of representatives here and so uh, we're going to focus mostly on that and please uh, write in or call in your questions on any topic uh, you have. We're going to start with taxes though um, and so uh, the tax bill was released by the House Majority Caucus. There's a lot in the bill. Representative Zlesnikar, can you, you talk as somebody in the minority, probably not a lot of input in this bill yet, but no. uh, your thoughts on the bill, both some things maybe you like in the bill or some questions you have about the bill. I think the tax bill for me, you know, coming into this session with a, you know, 17 billion dollar surplus, I thought we would have ta see tax cuts, that we would see full elimination of the Social Security tax, that that would be bipartisan, and that we would, you know, see some relief for the for the middle income, for the lower middle income, for for all economic brackets. And so I think having a, you know, multi-billion dollar increase in our spending has been the disappointment for me. Okay. Anything in the bill that you see as a positive? I think there's a lot of things that are a po you know there the positive pieces are is that you know we're going to be you know there's some pieces in there for the social security um, parts it's based on an income level so you know there's something that is is something's better than nothing type of a thing but then there's also um, increases in fees and a lot of increases in daily things that we do all the time whether it's DoorDash or deliveries or those types of things but I think the tax pieces um, the child care credits some of those types of things child tax credits um, I like the language that the Senate has better than the house because it's uh, more a uh, middle income based uh, instead of um, a higher amount for a very low income base. So th that piece I think we're going to see in conference committee. I like that. I think that will help Minnesota families. Okay, we're going to dive into some of these details in a minute, but Representative Olson, the Ways and Means Committee doesn't deal with the tax bill, but you serve on the tax committee. And so broadly, can you talk about uh, what you like in the bill and any uh, mm -hmm. questions you have on it too? Yeah, I mean, the tax and the budget bill go hand in hand. If we are going to pay for education, we're going to pay for nursing homes, we're going to pay for roads and bridges, we have to figure out how we're going to do that. And a lot of that happens within our tax bill. That is how we bring revenue into the state, right? So this tax bill in particular is a really great bill. It is largely a tax cut for most Minnesotans. So we cut Social Security tax on middle income earners. We invest in child care through child care tax credits so that families
families can help afford their child care and that low-income Minnesotans can see a benefit. Um, we do a lot of really great things in this bill to just like, our goal is not to, if you're, if you're making millions and millions of dollars and you did really well during the, te the, the pandemic, this isn't the bill that we're targeting towards those folks. We're targeting this to the people that have the hardest time affording their lives right now. We know that especially in Northeast Minnesota, child care. That is a big issue right now with affordability, and this tax bill does that. We target a lot of relief there. We also have the one-time checks for Minnesotans. It was a big priority of the governor. That's in there. So it is a tax cut bill, but it also does it in a way that we know we don't have a surplus that's ongoing in a big way. If we cut things now, it means that when the surplus goes away, we would be in a world of hurt. And so we needed to balance both how can we help Minnesotans right now in this moment that are struggling through our tax bill, but how do we do it responsibly so that we're not putting ourselves into a cliff in the future. And this tax bill really does that. And it you know, captured all of the votes of our caucus, whether it be rural or urban, it didn't matter. You know, We really saw this as something that invests in every corner of our state. And it's a really good bill. Great, and please uh, send in those questions either by phone or email. We're gonna stick on the tax bill and Representative Olson, we're gonna have you start. Uh, so there is a significant budget surplus. Some of it is one-time money and uh, for those viewers, the way we've been talking about it around this table, not legislatively, is one-time money is, uh, it, we equate it to maybe getting a bonus on your check. You can't really always count on it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, there's a big portion of the surplus is this one-time money and then there's ongoing support, but there is a budget surplus. And so why a tax increase uh, uh, in the tax bill. Now the tax increase I believe is uh, for uh, joint filers making over a million dollars and single filers making over six hundred thousand dollars roughly impacting about 0.8 percent of Minnesotans. But why a tax increase when we have a budget surplus? Right because as, as you talked about it's one-time money so you can't give a child care worker or, or an increased wage with one-time money. You have to have ongoing way you're going to pay for it. And so in order to pay for the things we want to do in our state, like we want to invest in education. We have woefully underinvested in public education and we are going to do something substantial this year, which we are going to make sure school districts have reliable per pupil funding tied to inflation but that takes ongoing revenue. And so in order to have, be able to do the tax cuts we talked about, you have to pay for them, right? And so what we're doing is, as you mentioned, the tax is on if you make a million dollars, it's after you've made a million dollars, it's the next dollar, you pay 10 cents of the tax on that. So we're not talking about probably, I don't know, maybe this group probably isn't the ones that are gonna feel that pinch, right? It's the people that did really well during the pandemic, the people that you know are the wealthiest in our state, to your point, I think you know, 0.8% of, of the population would see that. And so in order to pay for the other things where people are struggling, where wages, where you know, home care workers are making $13 an hour, and we wanna give them a bump, but you need ongoing revenue to do this. So we put together a tax bill that, that if you're middle, low income, you don't see an increase. But if you're the wealthiest of the wealthy in our state, you will see a small increase. Representative Lesnikar, your thoughts on specifically this millionaire tax in the proposal? I think it's a big mistake because, you know, the people that are in that bracket ha don't have to be here. You know, they don't have to choose to live in Minnesota. We want them to choose to live in Minnesota. They are the people that volunteer. They are the people that give to the charities. They're the people that write the checks to support all the foundations in our community. And without them, you know, we are seeing a mass exodus out of Minnesota. We're not seeing people migrating to Minnesota. I think 20 something thousand left last year. And so we don't want those people to have their residency in Arizona or Florida. Uh, whether they're and they're probably older than me and they have the ability to leave they don't have to stay and so that is a question I get all the time is we are being taxed out of Minnesota and so whether or not we think they make too much money the reality is with they leave their money leaves with them and that means they're not going to be in going to the restaurants they're not going to be giving to the communities and they're not going to be volunteering and those are the people that volunteer so I think it's gonna be a loss to the community. And I think it's very short-sighted th uh, short thinking. That's any, my thoughts. Okay, any yeah. additional thoughts yeah, on that? Yeah, so the, this idea of millionaire migration out of the state just factually isn't true. We have lost people as a state, but they are the people that are in their 20s. It's actually the people that can't afford childcare, can't find uh, a, a, you know, a home at a price point. And so those are the folks that are leaving. And so that's exactly where our tax bill, is, tax bill is investing is those families. We want them to stay here and choose Minnesota and be able to afford childcare, afford a home and have a good paying job. And so that's really what the tax bill is, is all about. 
Uh, we're going to stay on the tax bill. A few viewers have questions about this. We always get questions mm -hmm. about the Social Security tax. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, th there were proposals uh, on a on a host of levels from total elimination mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. uh, graduated up. It looks like in this proposal, uh, right now, currently, 50% of Minnesotans do not pay a Social Security tax. This would increase that up to about 76%. And so that would be uh, for families making $100,000 and single folks making $78,000. And so uh, we're going to start with you, Representative Lesnikar. Uh, I, I believe you are supporting a full repeal. Uh, why would we put more money towards folks making over $100,000 getting a tax cut versus keeping that money and, say, investing it in education or our roads or something else? I think the people that already paid the tax once know how to support the communities twice. And so I get a lot of emails and calls from people saying, how did this number come about? Why is there, if you doubled the single amount, that's more than $100,000. So they feel like that number is arbitrarily um, to their detriment and they think it's a mistake and I agree with them. They've already paid the taxes uh, one time and I don't think they should ever be taxed twice. I don't think that's the way we should be funding programs. We're increasing our spending in Minnesota with a almost $20 billion surplus. It's not necessary and it's not good policy. So I, I think that it's short-sighted for the communities. Representative Olson, why not a total elimination of the tax? I think you explained it already. 50% of people in Minnesota already do not pay a tax on Social Security. We're going to bring that up to 75%. And when we talk about the number of uh, someone making 100000 or 150000 we're not talking about what their income was. We're talking about what they're drawing on Social Security right now. So we're talking about people who likely may be sitting on $4 million and drawing down 150 a year in Social Security. So we're, we're already bringing that up quite high to a quite high income level where where we are you know want to make sure we're investing in seniors but seniors need more to live their lives they need to make sure that they have I know representative Zelesnikar it was really pushing for nursing home increases mm -hmm. but in order to do that that takes long-term funding and if we eliminated a full, full social security cap on the highest income earners and Social Security, it would cost our state billions of dollars in the future. We can't do it all. So we want to target who's going to get this relief. And it goes up to a pretty high threshold. And we can still do that and invest in education and invest in long-term care. But if we were to do the full exemption up to 100%, we wouldn't be able to do that. Anything else on this topic? I mean, I, I think we've, we've made our choices. We are funding things at billion dollar increases. And so it, we are not funding nursing homes in this bill. We are not at all funding nursing homes. We are funding the um, critical access nursing homes in Minnesota, but there's 300 nursing homes that are not there in Minnesota that are being left behind. And that's, there's nothing in here. We just carved out an amendment, $20 million uh, this last week on the House floor, but nursing homes are getting reimbursed on a cost-based model that is 18 to 24 months behind with no inflationary adjustment like education is going to have. And so we have nursing homes closing this week. And so we are not taking care of the nursing homes. Where would you like to see those dollars come from then? I've, I've always said I have no idea why we're doing a $1.7 billion from the surplus and, and creating a new program at a government level called the Family Paid Medical Leave Act which is going to give employees up to 24 weeks off a year. And at a time when we're not taking care of the core things, the teachers aren't getting their pension piece done, we're not taking care of seniors in nursing home, we're not dealing with the public safety. And so I don't think we add new programs to government till we are stellar in the core principles that we need to do. And this is a program you know quite a bit about as one of the authors of the mm -hmm. legislation. Rep. Olson, do you want to talk about that bill? Yeah, so paid family and medical leave, this is something that I think has been top of mind for Minnesotans, the fact that we don't have paid family and medical leave you know, is starting to put us as an outlier as a state and let alone as a nation. And this is something that can both help the workforce. You know, we have, we saw during the pandemic in particular, you know, women and we're leaving, moms were leaving to be home with their children, you know, whether it was because they can't find childcare, they don't have paid family and medical leave. We have a workforce shortage right now and investing in our workers and paid family and medical leave is one of them. Um, so whether you're caring for an aging parent or you, you know, just had a baby or you're adopting it's like basic human dignity to be able to be able to stay home and take care of your child um, let alone setting kids up for the future it's one of the best things that parents can do is stay home and bond with their child during those critical times it can have the longest term impact on a family's well-being and that child's brain development I mean just it's it's exponential what can happen by investing in those early years and especially that bonding right away and so this bill allows for that but it also really is about the workers too and making sure that we have a healthy workforce that we're keeping people in 
in jobs as we need them in these critical sectors. And I think this really keeps people in those jobs and have that benefit. And it's something we're long overdue in doing. And you know, we ran on this and we said this is something we got elected to do it and we're going to do it. And so, and we have the ability to do it with the surplus too. Representative Lesnikar, you talked about no new programs, but your thoughts on the overall proposal as an idea? I mean, I think the, there's a lot of ideas that are great, but if it's, this is an unfounded mandate for the schools, it's going to be for the cities and for the counties, and I've heard from them all across the state saying, nobody's listening to us. This is going to be an increase for taxpayers across the state. And so I think it's, it's setting us up for a catapult of long-term impacts that are going to come because every single imp uh, uh, company has been sending me emails from every size because unlike the, the Family Medical Leave Act of federal that is available up to 12 weeks, this is 24 weeks and it's going to put a, 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 a provision for the employee to possibly pay unless the employer chooses to pay the whole portion and that's not the real cost. The other real cost is replacement of people and so we have workforce issues right now and we also have, we have people that have left the workforce because they want to stay home with their kids. And I've always supported that. I've been a champion for family child care. We lost 700 family child care providers in Minnesota. And we don't make it easy for them to stay and create a business. And so we penalize those people. And at a time when we're incentivizing the center-based child care model. So I think there's a lot of things we can do to help family members stay home and create a business for themselves to help women have entrepreneurial ship and allow them to stay home with their children when they want to with family child care that would help the workforce and then help everybody because at the end of the day if you take 12 weeks off for a family measure but the nursing homes are closed there's 52 weeks in a year so if we lose 300 nursing homes there's going to be you know 40 other weeks that families need for, for care, and we can't have the hospitals be the backup system. They already don't have a placement because the nursing homes are the only model that have 24-hour nurses, predominantly in Minnesota. So if we lose them, families are gonna end up caring for people in their homes because there's not going to be a viable option. So I think we need to get the horse solid before we add carts in programs. It's not that it's not a great idea, but we have a federal um, Family Medical Leave Act. And if we're going to exceed it at a time when the businesses were shut down by government at no fault of their own, and they're still crawling out of a pandemic, it's not, it's not a good plan because all of our food costs are going to go up and all of the restaurants and the, the, the grocery stores and the garbage companies, everybody's calling me saying this is not a good idea. This is going to hurt Minnesota, not just northern Minnesota, but the entire state. Any last word on this? Well, I would say I think you brought up a really good point is, you know, with, with the care families need, whether it be with nursing homes, the expectation of care, and this bill allows for that, for families to take care of, you know, aging people to take care of children. And we are investing. It's a one-time cost, which is why even if the Republicans chose not to do it, they don't have money to do anything long-term. We, we put a one-time investment into businesses to be able to stand up this program, and then we fund the program, the operation of it moving forward. But it's kind of this one-time cost. This is the time to do it. And there are people across our state who, who desperately need this and have been asking for us, and now is our time to get it done. Any last word? You know, I think there are going to be businesses that are going to choose to leave Minnesota. I, and then if we don't have the business, there is no benefit for the employee. So then we're, we're a double, it's a double whammy. And so I think that we have paid family uh, medical leave right now. We have 12 weeks. And so I think this is a cost and, and people are very worried about what the implications are going to be. And it's not funding. There is, there's one time funding of 1.7 billion to get the program, a government agency up and running. There is no funding for the employer to do the replacement costs. So they're going to double their costs for us as we buy goods. Lumber's going to go up, food's going to go up, transportation costs are going to go up because now they have to f assume how many people are going to be off of work by this factor on a payroll tax in addition to replacing another person at work. Okay. Well, we're going to keep it in the tax bill realm here. Are many questions about rebates. And so we talked about this one-time money and the governor proposed a fairly robust, that most folks said, uh, rebate. It got a lukewarm reception by both Democrats and Republicans in the legislature. However, in this tax, tax bill, there is a proposal for uh, $275 or up to $550 for a couple of tax rebates. So many of the viewers want to know kind of the status of this. Representative Lesnikar, are you supportive of the one-time rebate checks uh, going back to taxpayers for that portion? portion of the surplus. Right. We all campaigned on a rebate, at least I did, and I think every Republican did, and I, as far as I know that many of the DFL did, but I think 250 is a slap in the face. I mean, we overtaxed Minnesota, 
we were proposing 12, 1,250 for single and you know more for a married couple. And I think this is a, a, a pittance of what you should be getting for a rebate check. When you have a $20 billion surplus and you're growing government by $9.5 billion in additional spending and growing the budget. So no, I don't think it's enough. I think it's, it's small and you know $250 is, is not a lot of money today. Would you support the governor's level? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Representative Olson. I think we landed where we need to. We've heard just in this discussion the tension already. If we would have done a full Social Security tax repeal, we couldn't have done the rebate. Like math is math is math. We have to balance our budget, right? And we have obligations of things we have to fund. And so I think we came up with a, a, a plan that really gives money back to people in a variety of ways. You get this cash in your pocket through these $275 checks. You get a tax credit to help you pay for child care. You get some social security relief. I mean, we get, we're able to do a lot for people in a way that also is honest and really sets us up to not fall off again into the future and, and have to cut programs. Like I also care not just about what we do now, but I wanna make sure things are set up so that in four years and beyond, that we're not in a situation where we have to cut programs or we have to, because we did too many um, tax cuts that then we have to go back and think, oh my gosh, we have to cut our schools. Um, so this is a plan where it is putting money in, in people's pockets right now, but it's also doing so in a way that is responsible to fund all of the other obligations of our state budget. Okay. Any last word on this? I think, I mean, we're, we've grown government. I mean, I think to the point earlier is they took a little bit to make every single person in the DFL happy. And so we spread $20 billion out of a surplus so everybody's happy without really taking care of education, really taking care of public safety, really taking care of nursing homes. And so I, I don't think that's the way to do it. I think we should have targeted the top hitting things. We shouldn't be adding new programs like Paid Family Medical Leave Act, you know, unemployment for the summers for education, for the hourly workers, all these things. We added costs to our government without taking care of our core anchors right now. Any last word? I'd say we're crystal clear. It's not about, it never is about me or my party. It's about doing the best thing we can for Minnesotans. And I think the governor said it best. Like our priority here is to make Minnesota the best state it can be to raise a family. And I think that is exactly what you see in this budget. It's not about um, political favors. It's about investing in the Minnesotans who need it most. And that is true across the board. One other portion of the tax bill is LGA or local government aid and this is funding that goes to cities townships and counties uh, from the state to help with core government services and so uh, the uh, viewer that is asking is actually the mayor of a small town up here of 350 people uh, and says their LGA has decreased substantially over their uh, their 16 years of being mayor will we actually see an increase in our LGA in the near future or will any increase go to larger cities? Representative Olson, do you want to take this first? Sure, I think that is something we hear. Local government aid is super important for communities to be able to fund core services. And so we do an increase in, in the bill that we just passed, the tax bill, um, which we just passed at the House floor, does have an increase. And I don't know the situation of this exact city who's, who's calling in, but there is the formula that allows for increase. And so we'll see, I know in Northern Minnesota, there are places that are seeing increase increases and are pleased with the numbers in this bill. I don't know exactly what city this mayor represents, but um, yes, we are investing more in local government aid in this tax bill. Your thoughts on local government aid? I think it's a huge thing. Hermantown has is, is always got nothing. Uh, Proctor is going to get an increase and so is Two Harbors. And so I think Northern Minnesota is gonna see increases from local government aid. Uh, that's one of the, the better parts of the tax bill, you know, to be honest, is local government aid and then having some, you know, support in that function for, for cities. Okay. Uh, another viewer is asking about a rainy day fund. I know we're in surpluses now, but we seem to go from surpluses to deficits and it can swing back and forth based on many conditions. Uh, is there any money set aside from the surplus into a rainy day fund? So I can take this yeah. if you want to try. Um, so yes, yeah, so we we do have a balanced budget. So in order to set our budget, we, we do it every two years. But we do it in Minnesota is unique. Not only do we set our two year budget, we also think about the two years beyond it. Even though we're not bound to that, we're only bound to these two years. So we think about the budget overall. And Minnesota does a great job with thinking about a structural budget. And part of that is the rainy day fund. And in the past, there have been 
shifts and gimmicks, that's kind of the terminology, but essentially the robbing of the rainy day fund to pay for things. We do not do that. So we, we make sure that we have what we need so that government continue to function and kind of weather that up and down. And again, why the entire approach that we talk about is so important to get right. And so we don't take anything from that rainy day fund. And there are sp specific places where in our budget areas, we're actually investing into special revenue accounts too, to kind of take spending and extend it out a little bit longer as well. Anything on the rainy you know, day fund? My concern is that the budget forecast is it's not showing that the corporations are coming into Minnesota. And so we're seeing some of those taxations that are coming in. It doesn't look like it's going to be, we're going to be seeing growth in that. And I don't think the policies that we've laid out for businesses are going to have that happen. And so I think we're going to see the repercussions in the next few years from these policies that we're laying right now. And so that's my concern. Uh, we have many viewers that are asking about education, and both of you have brought that up thus far. It seems like a significant portion of the surplus is going towards education funding. But I've also heard debate happen that uh, the education funding is tied to different priority, specific priorities. And so, Representative Lesnikar, uh, how do you feel about uh, the amount of the budget and surplus that is going to the education? The GOP's perspective is that, you know, there's $2.2 .2 billion that the DFL has proposed for education, and we support that. The difference is we wanted 5% and 5 and 5 on the formulary, formulary and then having it, um, the cross subsidies the same, but there's less mandates, you know, making sure that we have this, the transportation taken care of and some of those issues. So, you know, making sure that, you know, we're giving the local control to the districts. I think we have independent school districts for a reason in Minnesota, and I don't think all the mandates should be set by the state of Minnesota, and I think it's a mistake. And so, uh, before Representative Wilson have you respond, and so the the five and five percent, there's a education funding formula, mm -hmm. and you're talking about yes. a percentage increase on that funding formula itself, and the cross subsidy has to do with a federal mandate on special the education special funding. Yes. Okay, great. Yes. Uh, go, uh, Representative Olson, your thoughts on the education proposal and anything that Representative Les in the car yeah. said? I think this is one area, you know, it is a big piece of our state budget. Always has been. It's our responsibility as a state government to, to fund our schools, and we do. And we are able to do a per pupil increase uh, of what we talked about. I think we all would have liked the 5%, but again, as we've just discussed here, there's a lot of tensions within our state budget. And so we were able to do a substantial per pupil increase in this budget, but I think more importantly, we tie it to inflation which means that uh, school districts can have predictable funding. So if you're gonna hire teachers, bring down class sizes, make structural decisions, you can do it because you know you don't have to read the political winds of two years from now and figure out like where are we gonna be, how do we, you know, we know that the increase will happen. Um, and so it's a predictable stream of funding for our schools, which I think is great. I think one thing as well, it's a lot of money and you can't just get to outcomes without having some benchmarks, right? It's like you don't shoot money out of a confetti can and just hope for the best. You have to have some direction of how that money is going to be used and what are the outcomes we wanna see. And so I think we all wanna see our achievement gaps decrease. We wanna see our students you know, have the mental health services. We wanna see our teachers stay. I mean, there's a whole bunch of things that we need to get to with this money that isn't just giving a chunk of money and hoping for the best. So can you talk about maybe one of those, what Representative Lesenskar is saying is a mandate uh, that is more directed funding and the rationale for directing that funding in that area? That's a great question. I'm trying to think of like a one that would come to mind and maybe Representative Lesenskar knows well, <laughs> some of, of these too, but the UI. The, yeah. It was I the mean, one, anyway. Yeah, yeah one of th that is a really big concern to me is the um, unemployment for hourly workers, and I've heard from districts across the state that they're very worried of how we're going to fund this. At, Can you explain what that is? That means hourly workers, paras, bus drivers, cooks, janitors that are working in a school district on a nine-month calendar will now be eligible for unemployment all summer. So I've gotten a lot of feedback from people from in the tourism industry and restaurants and saying this is going to hurt our workforce. I mean, these are people that worked in the summers and I have a lot of, so that's a, that's a new cost for the districts and an unfunded uh, cost to the districts. And so, dis so my concern is the, the four and 2% that we're talking about, the DFL has, those are gonna go to these costs. We're just transferring money to another fund that we're creating a new cost center for districts and we're not gonna, teachers aren't gonna see the increase they're thinking they're gonna get. The districts are gonna be short. And I would say the unemployment for hourly workers is like we watched what was required of our hourly workers during the pandemic. You know, they were delivering meals on school buses. They were providing childcare. They, you know, were so essential. 
and you know risk their lives for a lot of these really important jobs and you know they're barely scraping by barely able to to get pay for what they need for their family so what we're saying is if school districts can keep these people on during these shortages uh, have jobs for them in the summer through summer school programs through other things they're not eligible for unemployment insurance if they're offered a job and turn it down so this is the option for those that they want to stay in this job they want to have it but they need to also provide for their families and it's something we do in other areas so this is something we can do for our schools. We have a policy question related to education, Bill, and uh, this caller is a former educator and has read an article that critical race theory will now be a social studies standard and wondering if that is true or not. Representative Lesnikar, do you know the answer to that question? I would say yes. It's ethnic studies is, the, is what it's called, and ethnic studies is in the education bill. Okay. So I, I think that would be an accurate statement. And what, is right? that, and what does that mean? Yeah. Well, <laughs> it means, it means, I think the concern is, is that in the feedback I get from people is they want us to be talking in the human race, not to make a child think that because of the color you're born or the, the location you're born or the income level you're born at, that that is at all the fault of the child, uh, that all children should be going into the education system with an idea that we are all part of the human race. It's 2023 that we should be teaching. And the other part with it is that the ethnic studies piece is going to take class time. It's going to take away from other things that the teachers in the, in the school districts are going to have to pick because there's only so many hours in a day. We have an achievement gap right now. We have 30 to 50 percent reading um, proficiency at grade level. So kids are not caught up. There are gaps in learning right now that are monumental. So adding another thing on top of a the fact that we don't have math and reading and the core curriculums happening is concerning to many parents. Absolutely. Well, and I think critical race theory is its whole, we do not talk about that. That is not something we're mandating. That is not something that's coming out of anything we're doing at the legislature at all. And I think, you know, Representative Zelesnikar is right that we're talking about ethnic studies in terms of what we're having our school districts t talk about because you know we live in a diverse world and a lot of histories within our own state have not been taught and we talk a lot about you know we have a number of indigenous legislators and the highest ranking indigenous leader in Peggy Flanagan our lieutenant governor and talking about like what gets taught in our schools and our own history and the diversity of our own state is so important to understand who we are where we come from what mistakes we don't want to repeat and so that we can move forward and so I think there is like a misunderstanding and a fear mongering that happens around just like our basic humanity and what we teach and about respecting each other and understanding the diversity of stories we have here. And so I just want to name that I think there has been like a totally misled conversation around from what is actually happening, which is just understanding who we are as Minnesotans in the diversity of ways that we have existed and will continue to exist together as a state. Anything else on this? I, you know, speaking of, of this, I thought one of the tribal leaders when we had Indigenous Day, there was, we had it at the Capitol, and, and one of the tribal leaders said, we are all people of color. And I thought that was a very amazing thing to be said, and very true. We are. We all come in from different ethnic backgrounds, and at the end of the day, we are all people of color. Okay. Any last point here? Well, I would say, you know, we have a... Uh, the uh, BIPOC caucus, the largest we've had, which is our- Can you explain what BIPOC yes, is? Yes, I did the acronym thing and I shouldn't. <laughs> so we right. have like people of color and indigenous folks. And so, you know, they have created a caucus and have like priorities that share like the achievement gap is real. The racism they face is real. Um, just uh, so many things that happen within our state government in, that they have like been so keen on saying this is what we can do to move the needle on the issues that impact our lives and create an agenda and really push that throughout our legislative legislative process and have really been so good about naming what we can do to really have racial equity and we can really think about racial justice. So I think we need to acknowledge that, that those adversities still exist and those systems have been stacked up against people of color and that we have to be super intentional about what we do and how we think about all of the legislation through that lens so that we can actually have a state where everyone can thrive and we have to name difference and because that is real and people's experiences are real and so we need to name those see those and think about what can we do in each part of our budget to move the needle on those and I think our again our posse caucus our bicoc BIPOC caucus has really helped us open our eyes to how we see every piece of legislation through that. 
I'll keep those questions coming in. Uh, we received a number of questions on uh, pensions, uh, educator pensions and public employee pensions. Are either of you up to speed on where we're at with the proposals for uh, public employee or educator pensions. Uh, Representative Wilson, you're nodding your head. We'll let you go yes, first. Yes, sort of. I mean, like this is like we're going deep on all areas yeah. of the budget, which yeah. is great. It's like a test so that we can be better ready to go about our week, right, Natalie? <laughs> like now we really know. So pensions, we had a $500 million pension target, which is actually substantial. Um, there's usually not a set separate pension amount that is like set within the global budget agreement, so that was set. That said, I think there is about $8 billion worth of pension asks that are on the table. So something we cannot move the needle on all of that in one, in one year, right? Um, it's a whole set of things, some of them 30 years in the making to get us to where we are. And so for example, the teacher pension that one of the issues we probably hear a lot about is $3 billion. Um, just that one alone. And so we have to think about what can we do now, knowing we st we'll have a lot more to do to get pensions where they need to be. But in particular, the teacher pension is, you know, stemming from a decision that was made 30 years ago by how we would, how we would do this. And so we're going to do what we can and for the first time have a pension target that moves the needle on kind of the whole variety of all the pension plans and also know that we have much more to do. We just, you know, again, there is an, a finite amount of resources of what we can do this year, but we're very much aware of all of it and all, all of it is good things that need to be done. We just can't, don't have the resources to fully handle everything this, this biennium. Our sense of Lesnikar, progress? You know, from my standpoint, the resources are all there. We had $20 billion, 17 after we started, weeks in, a couple million were, billion were already spent. So, you know, we came in with a $20 billion surplus, which rebates were available, and the priorities were set by trifecta. I mean, the trifecta is there. So whatever wanted to happen could happen because we had $20 billion to start with. So the priorities and the targets that Representative you know, Olson set with were done by the DFL trifecta. So as far as the teacher pension goes, I just tell them, you know, that was set. Targets were set and that was not the priority. And so we have to now look forward to how we're going to deal with retirement ages. We're all living a lot longer. And then whatever we do for teachers, what are we going to do for police officers? What are we going to do for firefighters? What are we going to do for nurses that work shift, shift work and have to work 365 days a year? It's not a nine month calendar. So we have to look at equity and how we're going to do this um, as we move forward for the decades to come. I think actually, you know, you, that's a really good point uh, that you make is like that is why we couldn't do it all within this target because if you, the teacher's ask was three billion, the firefighters, the, te uh, the mm -hmm. you know, all of the, our frontline responders, I mean, it's our public state employees, the ones working in corrections, I mean, it's a whole host of people that you have to take care of in the pensions bill and so there are a lot of interest there and I think it sounds like we're pretty aligned in, you know, there is work to be done in all those areas. Any final words on this? Yeah, I, th I think for me, one of the bigger disappointments is to see, you know, the the point that the bus drivers and the the paras and these people are at the front line during the you know the pandemic. They they were able to work remote for a lot of years. Um, and the, the bus drivers. Not the bu well, they weren't oh. in school. You okay. know, we were we were not in school. I mean, the nursing homes never shut down, and we are leaving them on the sidelines. I mean, we. The nursing home workers took care of the frailest and the sickest people that were at the highest risk. And there was no families allowed to come in, no support. We didn't have childcare open, so the family stress was high. And the nursing home uh, employees are the ones left aside, which makes no sense to me coming into a $20 billion surplus. And that's to me really disappointing because they never, we can't, those facilities can't work remote. They couldn't do remote and protect their families. They had to do what they had to do. And the government set the rule of how many days, 14 days, 10 days, seven days, you had to be outside of work. There was no second line, third line, fourth line to bring in, like hockey, to replace somebody. So the facilities had to work short. And then the state of Minnesota fined assisted livings $3 million during COVID. And they fined nursing homes $1 million. And they act surprised that people have a credit line because the food costs went up and there's no inflationary adjustment in their uh, reimbursement system like education and other things that I'm seeing in the budget. So to me, that's very disheartening because that is the group of people that built Minnesota. When I would say that is in our budget, we look at all of it, the, the lowest paid employee taking care of someone who requires a college degree is a, a childcare worker, you know, $13 an hour. 
and they take care of our kids. We leave them in the hands of these people and they make $13 an hour. And so when we're talking about a budget, we want to increase their wages. We want to increase the wages of our nursing home workers. We want to do that for those doing the home care work who during the pandemic had to go into people's homes to make sure that they, they could you know, bathe, that they could eat, that they could do those basic human dignity things. Like we don't wanna leave anybody behind or pit anybody against anyone. We need to lift all boats. And I think that is really what we tried to do in our budget is like I think a lot about the child care workers of your workers in your nursing homes. They had to leave their kids who also were providing that care and were making $13 an hour. That we need to make sure we try to lift everybody's wages and we do that. Like our health and human services budget really tried to bring everyone's wages up. Um, but again, it takes ongoing investment and it needs to make sure we have balance and we have to make sure that we're paying for those things. I think what my response would be on the child care piece, we increase the mandates. The mandates, we are increasing mandates without money. And so an example is some of the child care workers haven't been four-year degrees. We're putting mandates that they have to be four-year. And I've had people call me from Minneapolis saying, this is not going to help our child care issue. We're going to take great people out of the off, out, out of the business because now they have to have a four-year degree. They don't want a four-year degree. They've been doing this for 10, 15 years. They're fabulous. But now it's going to be mandated that they have to have a four-year degree. To the same extent, we are eliminating tier two. So teachers, I was in Proctor on Friday. That's why I have my shirt from the welders, the girls. On. Can you explain you know, what tier two is? Tier two is for people that have great experience. They're in the schools for the trades. They're doing welding. They're doing, um, AV, they're doing uh, rails TV. They're doing um, welding classes, they're doing um, chef teaching, they have, they're doing cooking classes. Those people are there because they have great experience and they've been doing a phenomenal job. We've built trades programs across the state. I've been a proponent of that and now we're going to not allow them to do that. So there's 27 of those people in northeastern Minnesota that are gonna, we're going to be at risk of losing them at a time when we can't find teachers. Our sounds Leslie Carr is talking about some mandates either in child care or education. Care to respond? Well, I don't think what you do to come out of a crisis like this is, is drop standards. You don't lower the quality of care. You talk about like we fundamentally have, have to have a conversation about what it means to provide care in our society. We underfund it, we undervalue it, whether we talk about paid family medical leave, we talk about child care workers, we talk about nursing home, PCA. Like it's not, we're not gonna get ourselves out of this by cutting all the red tape and making it you know, unsafe to leave your child at a facility. What we get out of this is talking about like, it matters who's providing care for our kids. And we should, we should, we should make sure that they can afford their lives, that they can provide care to their families, that they don't have to live off financial assistance, that they don't have to worry about the roof over their head. So I think that's really the conversation we need to have and where we can invest as a state. Okay, I'm gonna get back to a viewer's question right now. A caller is wondering how much money is being spent on, in their words, illegal immigration. Is money being spent in northern Minnesota to support these folks? Representative Lesnikar, we'll start with you. I would say the answer is yes. I mean, I think we're going to now have uh, that, that group of people are going to be eligible for health care in the state of Minnesota. And so, yes, it's, a, it's an absolute yes. I mean, so we right now did the driver's license for all. And so we my perspective was I voted with the, the Republicans that we should have a driver's license, but it should say not eligible for voting, that it should be very clearly a different one like you have for people that are over 21 when you can't drink until you're 21. So it, to me, it was an easy way to do the accomplished public safety, that they have a driver's license, they're insured, uh, but that it would look different. And uh, the Democrats voted that they will have the same driver's license as us. And the next thing has happened is uh, the insurance piece that we heard this week. So I fully expect that they will, uh, it won't be just emergency room uh, cost. They believe that the best thing is to insure everybody as the same as all of us at the table, uh, regardless if you're here uh, as a legal citizen or not and went through the process. And so they're going to move that route is what it looks like. Well, I would say no human is illegal. Um, it's someone who's undocumented in our state, I think is what we would talk about. And these are the people that are providing like a lot of the basic services who kept our food coming to us during the, you know, when everything was shut down, they were going to the meat packing plants. It was a lot of people that were risking their safety, you know, going into jobs that no one else would want to do. I mean, really, we talk about it. It's people coming in and doing key parts of our 
work for our state, who want to be able to drive to work safely, who deserve to have health care. And we don't fund a, a le I don't remember exactly what the question, but we don't fund a legal immigration at all. We take care of people who are in our state who are working, who are trying to do the right thing with their families. And so, yes, we want to make sure people have health care because you know what happens? You still get sick. And you know how you, what happens when you get sick and you don't have health care? You go to the emergency room. That is the most expensive way to get care. So either way, we're paying for it. And why would we not want to make sure people can take care of their health and make sure that they're doing preventative care and doing all that before they have to go take a more expensive route, which just comes back to uncompensated cares that the hospitals, as we know, is a very expensive way to do care. And so we are making sure as a state that we're taking care of people because it's the right thing to do, but it's also financially the right thing to do as well. Another big bill that uh, passed off of the House floor and actually the Senate floor uh, in the past week or so is uh, recreational marijuana or cannabis use. We have a yes vote on the panel and a no vote on the panel, so I'd like to get both of your perspectives on this. Representative Olson, why did you support recreational cannabis? This is a long time coming. I mean, it's like most Minnesotans agree, it doesn't matter your political stripes. I have Republicans and Democrats in my district who this has been their priority since you know, I uh, first ran for office and we know that the war on drugs isn't working, right? Like there is an illegal black market, it's already happening. And we also know after we did a small dose legalization this year, things are going well in Minnesota. And so this has been a long time coming in terms of adult use recreational marijuana. And so this is a way to regulate it, to tax it, and then also to do some expungements around like just the failed, like how bad this has been at exasperating racial injustice in our state. And so this bill is a really comprehensive approach on how we handle cannabis in our state. And so I think this is a great step forward and something that has had a ton of work and a lot of stakeholder input for the last you know, bunch of years. And it's also a way, to be honest, to grow our economy, like talking about micro businesses, um, you know, that are going to be in the state of Minnesota. They're very excited to start up and to invest in what this can be for our state. So I think it's a great bill and I'm excited this is going to get done this year. Representative Liz in the car. I voted no and I'm going to wait to see what happens on the conference committee. The Senate has a different version and the reasons I voted no is there's no, there was no local control. Uh, I felt that, you know, it's like with liquor licenses, the cities should have some control over where these are going to be. Uh, I also was concerned that I think it's 1.5 pounds somebody could have of marijuana in their house. And that's like, I think it was described to me as 195 joints. It seems like kind of more of a dealership, you know, a lot of marijuana. So what does this look like? Uh, and how are we going to um, do this? So I, I want to see, and then the public safety. I mean, I talked to a lot of people, chief of police across the district. Uh, many people are concerned there's no way to test. Uh, you can test alcohol level uh, in, if you're impaired. We don't have enough uh, drug enforcement officers, and the budget doesn't allow for uh, a huge increase in them statewide. So I had some concerns on public safety. Um, but I understand that it's probably 50 to 60 percent would like to see it legalized, but what does this look like? On taxation, it's a very low tax rate for Minnesota. That was worrisome to me, too. I thought the ta taxation should be higher. It's basically a break-even business, unlike the other states. Okay. Anything else to say on this issue? When I would say the taxation, we were really deliberate on making sure that we didn't overtax. You know, we looked at other states and what they have done and really tried to think about just taxing enough to be able to sustain what we need to do to both set up the program and fund ongoing measures of it. But I think that was actually, you know, mostly Republicans usually like when we don't tax things as high. Um, but this was a really deliberate approach by looking at how other states have handled it. Any last words on you know, this? You know, I agreed with the criminal expungement. I've been working for years with people as an employer to help people through probation offices locally to help them, you know, get back in the workforce. So the expungement of records wasn't a problem for me. I, I was more concerned about local control and then looking at, uh, there's been a lot of feedback on just the percentages of the THC and then access if people are going to have, you know, 1.5 pounds in their house, you know, what that access is for kids and, and everything across the state. So. But I agree, it comes down to personal responsibility for everything. And so, you know, a lot of these things, it's difficult to mandate in society. And so it's trying to figure out the pros and cons of the, of the coin. And I'll take a second look at it when it comes back after conference committee. And so right now the bill is uh, both, there's a Senate version and House version. They're gonna air out 
uh, there are differences in details and try to find some agreement. I know Governor Walz has said he would sign this. Uh, what do you think the likelihood of this passing still this year is with everything else you have to do in the next three weeks? <laughs> Very good. Very good. Do you, do you agree? I, I agree. I, I think it's, it's, gonna, it's going to pass with or without my vote. Uh, I just want to see, uh, I hope it's going to be a better bill. I, I don't think the House bill is the version that is best for Minnesota. I think the Senate bill looks better, uh, but I want to see what it ends up after conference committee. A number of questions uh, this hour on property taxes, uh, property tax increases that folks are feeling and seeing. As a reminder to the viewers at home, property taxes are set primarily by your cities, your counties, your townships, and your school districts, though there is interplay between the state. Uh, a lot of times folks have asked about why is there no cap or mandate on an increase? Uh, is there any discussion about property taxes uh, from a state level and anything that you all can do to influence property taxes? Representative Lesnikar. That was one of the amendments we offered on the on the House floor this this last week uh, was to have a you know a five year look cap on what the percentage could be for an increase and it was turned down but I think that's a big concern for people in Minnesota valuations went through the roof on property and so correlations of property taxes and then you know how that impl implicates people so I think that that's one of the things that is on the mind of a lot of people right now is property taxes. Well, and I think one of the things we touched on earlier is local government aid. Um, when we're able to provide um, funding for our local governments, you know, our county aid too, we do county aid, we do local government aids. It allows to have the, then the local municipalities that do set their, their levies that they can look and that we can give them funding so that it, it, they can stretch their budgets a little bit. So there are things we're doing in our tax bill that maybe aren't as direct as the property tax relief that you're talking about, but it does help to be able to give more relief to our local governments who then are do the levies and whatnot. And same with our school districts too. The more we fund in the education bill, um, the less that you know they have to look to the taxpayers to fund things. Even even though that's you know okay to do and I you know fully support that but we can do what we can at the state level to lessen some of that Great. anything else on this I think that about sums it up I think people want to see it lower okay so uh, there's three weeks left to the legislative session uh, what is one thing you hope that gets done uh, in, in the time left and we'll start with you representative Olson I think overall, like I'm very excited for the, our whole budget to come together and see that big picture and to see how Minnesotans' lives will start improving. Like I'm watching the effective dates of a lot of the bills, which means when things start happening, I'm like, by July and August 1st, like people's lives will, could be like substantially better because what we do, somebody's wage could go up. They could know that what childcare will be for them, how they can pay for it going forward. They could have that walls check in their pocket. You know, it's just incredible to see that all come together in, in a final way. And what I wanna see is not just like what we deliver that's gonna help, but that we show government can work and it can work for Minnesotans. And I think that's the story of this session too, is not just what we're going to get done, but how we're going to get it done. Get it done in an efficient and timely way and do it in a way that's gonna help improve people's lives. Lives. One thing you hope gets done here in the last three weeks. You know, for me, it's what what does one Minnesota look like? It's not what's in this bill, it's what's not in this bill. And nursing home funding has to happen. And then making sure if we don't have businesses come, there is not a job and then there's not employ employees don't have a way to make a living. And we've increased nonprofits and we've increased government spending at record levels. And so I think we have a 40% increase and I, I don't see that as sustainable. And I think that's what is concerning to me and I, I, I hope that we'll see nursing homes get funded for sure and that we see some relief uh, for everyday Minnesotans where they, you know, their cost of groceries are through the roof, everything is high. And so we need to make sure that, I hope the social security tax gets completely eliminated and we fund nursing homes. So one other large bill that was discussed early on has kind of been on hiatus, but is on the minds of many Northern Minnesotans is a bonding or capital investment bill. And so this is the funding that the state does, borrows money to invest in local and regional infrastructure projects, roads, bridges, buildings, and our colleges and otherwise. I know both of you have supported the bill. We haven't heard much about it recently, and there's only three weeks left. This is something that didn't get done last year. Uh, what is your progn prognostication? I always say that word at the end here, and I always, <laughs> it spills out of my mouth backwards, but what are the yeah. chances that that bill gets done, and what are you hoping to see out of that? I think it's, I mean, I voted yes for the bonding bill because I think bonding is something that is just part of the infrastructure responsibility that is a responsibility of government to do that. We, we bond for that and so there's a piece of it that's cash and then there's a piece of it with the bonding um, but I you know it's gonna help northern Minnesota and the cost you know we didn't do a bonding bill the last year or two so we have delayed projects and it's just increasing costs we've got gaps
maps for Highway 61, so we wanted to get that taken care of to get the road done. Hermantown's got projects, Rice Lake's got projects up here, so we had a lot of them that are really critical, and I know there's some in, in Representative Olson's district too, and I think that's good for Northern Minnesota, it's good for the state. Representative Olson. I agree, and I'm hopeful we'll get it done. Um, we were able to pass it off the, the okay. House floor, which is great because it takes Republican votes and Democrat votes. Senate was not able to do that, but we do have enough cash in our budget bill um, that if we need to do one as a cash only and you know not worry about getting the super majority of Republican votes, I think we'll do it. Great. Uh, just in the last few seconds, 10 seconds apiece, uh, we have many more questions. Folks want to know what's <laughs> on your guys' mind. What's the best way to contact you in the last three weeks, Representative Olson? Please email me or call my office and we'll make sure we get back to you. All right. How about you? Absolutely. Just go on representative uh, natalie.zeleznikar at house.gov. All right. Great. Well, thank you both. And we are out of time. I would like to thank Representative Natalie Zeleznikar and Representative Liz Olson for joining us today. Minnesota Legislative Report will return next Sunday when we welcome more legislators from northern Minnesota to answer your questions. From the team at PBS North, I'm Tony Sertich. Have a great evening. You're right, it goes.